UniverseMagazine.com and other portals uh, reported this. The first manned space mission to the asteroid belt can be carried out within 50 years, um, only if people reach Mars by 2038. I don't quite understand why those things are connected, but this is the conclusion reached by Jonathan Jiang from the JPL, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Uh, the work of his team was to determine the time frame during which the first crewed mission to the asteroid belt, to Jupiter and even to Saturn, would take place. Um, other sources of media kind of reported this uh, a little less um, obfuscatorily, or whatever the word might be, and just basically said that uh, there's a plan eventually to land on an asteroid. Is that so? And why would we want to do that? Well, it's very difficult to obviously decide what we might or might do in decades to come. The only thing we do know is that we're going to the moon in the next few years, and the development of a, a lunar base will take a decade or so as we learn to live off the land, as we learn to transport people there and live in space, um, and conduct uh, simulations of the much longer flight to Mars. And if uh, the technology can be developed from going to the moon to take us on to Mars, we could expect a flight to Mars around about 2040. Um, but who's to say if it will happen? But as for an asteroid, now, it's hard to say why we would want to go to an asteroid. Uh, we've been to asteroids with unmanned probes. And the, the, well, the Japanese did it recently, them. didn't they? Exactly, yes. We know what asteroids are like. And when President Obama, who was... I have to say, in general, not a very good space president, uh, cancelled the constellation project of going back to the moon, sending people back to the moon, and replaced it with a trip um, to, of astronauts to an asteroid. Most people were dismayed by this because it was not um, a big enough goal for the world's leading spacefaring nation. And as we said just a moment ago, we've been, we've, we know what asteroids are like. They are, they are interesting, but there's, there's nothing there we will learn by putting a person on an asteroid other than just taking a picture of a person on an asteroid. So, yes, we may someday go to asteroids, uh, but I think it will be decades and decades after we've gone to Mars in the 2040s. And it's, it's hard to say because of the length of time that astronauts would have to be out in space to, to go to an asteroid, as a, unless one came very close to the Earth, why you would want to do it. Um, well, may Should maybe, we David, sorry to asteroids. jump in, maybe just like a lot of these things, I wonder, and look, I'm, I'm no scientist, but I wonder if we would do it simply to prove that we could because that might be useful to us at some point in the future. For example, if we discover something heading this way out of a clear blue sky, maybe we'll want to go to it to understand, you know, why it's uh, such a threat to us. I don't know. Well, certainly we need to know a lot about asteroids because uh, it's it's possible that they may threaten us. They've hit the Earth in the past and undoubtedly at some stage in the future they will strike the Earth again. So we need to know more about them. There's a, a, a probe going to an asteroid later this year to, uh, to try and deflect a moonlet around an asteroid to understand how we can move these things around. But you don't need people to do that. Um, the problem, the problem with um, exploration of the solar system is that you have the Moon and you have Mars and you have the prospects of mining asteroids. Now you don't need to send people to mine the asteroids, but apart from that, uh, sending people further than Mars is, is difficult to contemplate at the moment because of the length of the voyage, because of the effect on the human body of a long voyage, uh, because we don't have the technology, and because there are no places to go. I mean, you can't go to Jupiter because uh, you can only land on the moons and they are drenched with radiation and they would kill you in pretty short order. So certainly when we've gone to the moon and when we've colonized Mars, it might be possible that somebody might want to take a trip to a, a nearby asteroid. But I wouldn't think it was a, a highlight of, of, of human space exploration over the next 50 years or so. Makes a good headline, though, doesn't it? It does. It's a good story. <laughs> there was, I mean, kind of tangentially linked to this, there was another story, I don't have it here, but I remember what it was this week, that sort of suggested that the first explorers who go to Mars might start a process of modifying the humans who have to live there. In other words, that you know, they will be almost genetically modified in order to uh, cope with some of those hostile conditions about which you speak. Do you think we'll get to that? 
Yes, I, I think that's 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 a reasonable extrapolation. I mean, certainly we have to know a lot more about the human body to send people to Mars, because it's not so much technology as the effect of the voyage and weightlessness and radiation on people. And from what we understand about astronauts in low Earth orbit on the space station, the effect of being in space for a long time is catastrophic. We need to know a lot more, and that may well involve um, a lot more drugs, a lot more medicines, a lot, in fact, understanding how different genes are expressed when we're in space as opposed to down here on the ground. And it's not, um, it's not, it's, it's science fiction, but it's not impossible given the genetic power we have today to think of in the future, we may genetically modify ourselves to live on the red planet. Uh, it, it may well be that people who live on Mars will psychologically and eventually genetically become different from humans, uh, which is a fascinating idea that um, if we go and live on Mars for decades, the colony will be self will be sub, have to sub, uh, rely on supplies from Earth. But eventually, perhaps in a century or so's time, and who's to say when they become self-sufficient, if they ever do, they would have a, it would be a different planet. They would have a different mentality. They may not like Earth. They might not want to come back to Earth. They might not be able to come back to Earth. So perhaps our genetic um, lineage would take a different direction, whether you're a part of a colony on Mars or living on Earth. How this interesting. Is, this is, this is, you know, we can think about the next few decades about footprints on the moon and then going to Mars. But if we keep this endeavor up for centuries, then certainly there are going to be changes which would be very surprising and developments which we perhaps could not imagine. Indeed. And, you know, if we're going to, we mustn't kid ourselves. If we manage to pull off the technological feat of getting there, it's a fact that some people are going to have to stay there. And so they will have to, you know, they'll have to be colonists. They'll have to be people who pioneer, just as uh, America pioneered the Wild West. We'll have to pioneer yes. Mars, and the people who emerge from that are going to be different. Uh, and it's going to be a fascinating time. You and I sadly won't yes. uh, won't live in this incarnation to see to see that, but future generations will. Perhaps so. Yes. Um, also, the Chinese. Um, you know, we haven't heard quite in the last month or two as much space-wise from them, but I was reading on space.com this week that a proposed Chinese mission would look for nearby potentially habitable alien worlds by launching a spacecraft to make ultra-precise measurements of how orbiting planets make a star wobble. In other words, I think their technique of looking for habitable worlds beyond here is to look at the effect that those worlds will have on what's around them. Now, we use that technique for other things, but it's interesting to see it being talked about here. What do you think? Well, it's a, a tried technique. There are two ways to find planets around nearby stars. One is to, to look at their gravitational effect on the star, because the star will be um, wob will wobble, as you say, a bit, due to the fact that there is a planet orbiting it. And the other is to look at the dimming of the light of the star as the planet moves in front of it, a transit. Uh, both are well-used techniques, and we found, I think, over 5,000 planets around nearby stars using both those techniques. Uh, but what is interesting is that the Chinese, uh, because of their budget, because of their long-term view of these things, and their national desire to be not only important in, in human spaceflight, but in astronomy and space science, are starting to pick up things which, in the West, um, don't get funded properly or get funded and then they lose their funding and it is difficult to keep the momentum up in the West. In, in China, that doesn't seem to be the problem. They are building space telescopes which will be a, better than the Hubble Space Telescope. They're building up to building a space telescope as good as the James Webb Space Telescope. They already have the largest radio telescope in the world. And their suite of space-borne observatories that they are planning over the next 10 or 15 years is going to mean in 15 years' time they will overtake America as the world's leading astronomical nation. That was going to be my next question, David, but you being you, you were good enough to get there before me, and thank you for it. You. Uh, David, the new book, I got a preliminary version to look at. Uh, when is it? Uh, give me the title and tell me when that will be out, because I've had people emailing me. Well, you, um, you've got an uncorrected proof, which means that there are uh, half a dozen errors in it. Uh, but it's good enough to uh, to show to people to whet their appetites, um, so that we can plan 
how we talk about it. It's called the alien perspective. And it's basically about aliens. Now, from my point of view, I know it's different when you talk to other people on your show, we haven't found aliens. But the fact that we can think about them and look at the strange forms of life on our planet means we can start to extrapolate and think about what forms of life could be out there be in space and what it would mean, how they would become intelligent and, and what it would mean for the evolution, how would life last as the universe evolves. So it comes out in September, um, which you can pre-order it already, but it's a very different type of book from all the, the books you and I have talked about that I've written before, because there's a lot more storytelling in it and there's a lot more speculation, um, which I think, you know, from listening to your show, is the joy of your show because you speculate mm. and you tell stories. And that's, and what, know, that's what people yeah, want, I think, yeah. David. So I think it's going to be very I, successful. It could gonna, be fun, yes. I'm going to read it in the next week and we will talk again about it. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed, David. Dr. David Whitehouse.